Hello everybody, today I invite you to join me on a drive through some beautiful Scottish countryside on a fine evening in what must be the most important Fiat of the last 20 years. This is the all new Fiat 500 electric. than aware that I have a reputation as a 500 hater, or more accurately, an Abarth 595 hater. This is not a reputation that I'm going to fight, because it means if this car is actually any good, and I say so, that means Fiat have certainly succeeded. And I really do believe this is one of the most important cars the company has ever created. Viewers from the USA may be somewhat confused at the notion of an all-electric 500 as being something new. Indeed, when I heard that Fiat were making an electric 500, I thought they do already, don't they? Because my auntie's had one for about the last eight years. However, she lives in California. As it happens, the Americans were the only ones to receive the old 500 electric, which was essentially an electrified version of the car that I'm sure you're already familiar with. You only need to cast a glance at this car to realise that it genuinely is something all new. Yes, the overall profile is still recognisable Fiat 500, but in the same way that the new Mini looks like the previous Mini, which looks like the last Mini, which looks a little bit like the original one. This is somewhat larger than the outgoing car, about two inches longer, two inches wider, and an inch and a half taller. Here in Britain, you can have it either as a three-door hatch, which I'm driving today, or as a convertible. On the continent, you can also get what they call the 3 plus 1, which has a sort of RX-8 style suicide door on one side to allow you to get into the back just a little bit easier. The simple fact is, though many people don't like me for what I had to say about the old car, even those who really loved it did have to admit that it was getting a little bit long in the tooth. The platform could trace its roots back to the Fiat Panda, which is about 20 years old, and the engine can trace its roots back to the 1980s. So it was very much in need of an overhaul. Truth be told, for a car in this class, going hybrid is totally pointless. As far as I'm concerned, you want either a small capacity petrol or all electric. So the move to electric power, I think, is a very sensible one. Seeing as I'm sure many of you are expecting me to criticise the car, I may as well get a couple of things out of the way first. My biggest gripe thus far is the fact that the Fiat website is absolutely atrocious. Trying to do research on this was nearly impossible. I don't know if it's because I was viewing it on a phone, though in 2022 that really shouldn't be an excuse, but I simply could not get the information I wanted from it. All I really want from a car website is, what are the trim levels, what are the engines on offer, how much do they cost, what are the different features across the model lineup, tell me that in a nice, easy to read format. But no, instead the Fiat website was too hung up on looking pretty rather than telling me anything useful. The information I could glean from it wasn't always that important, but here's what I've been able to decipher. This car is available in several different trim levels. At the bottom you have the Action, then there is a Red, an Icon and this, the top of the range La Prima by Botelli. Fiat have decided to consult with Italian tenor Andrea Botelli to help produce this car. I must say, it does certainly feel a lot newer and more modern than the outgoing one. This car's owner, Vlad, who's a lovely chap that's recently moved to the area, did consider a Honda E. And I would say on the inside, the Honda certainly feels like the more space age sci-fi thing. This is still very familiar, dash here, stuck on iPad here, buttons down here, but for some, including myself, that's not necessarily a bad thing. You have Android Auto, Apple CarPlay, and it certainly feels a step above the old 500. Although, I do still have some issues. Scratchy plastics. I didn't like him in a £12,000 car, and I really don't like him in a £30,000 car, which is what this is. And that's one of the issues I have with EVs in general. They add so much more to the price that they don't really feel like they provide good value for money.
this car's owner also has a W12 Audi A8 and a 460 horsepower modified Lotus Exige. So I think we can all agree he's got his petrol head credentials in order. I must confess that for urban driving, I really am a fan of electric cars. They are quiet, comfortable, they do their best economy in town as well, and the theory goes, off the line, they should be pretty quick. As we appear to be the only car on this bit of road, let's put that to the test because I found not all EVs are actually that brilliant at the pull out at a junction thing. Put down, not brilliant. That's 30 there, so the initial response was decent, but it just doesn't fire you towards the horizon as some other EVs do. There are two different choices of battery pack and motor, but not all available with all trim levels. The base car comes with a 24 kilowatt hour battery with a 94 horsepower engine. This one has a 42 kilowatt hour battery with a 117 horsepower engine. So it's good for a top speed of about 94 mile an hour and a range of just shy of 200 miles. The other is more like 120. This means it's considerably better than the Honda E, which costs about the same and can only manage about 110 miles. That, to be honest, is just embarrassing in this day and age. That being said, when you're on the move at 50 mile an hour or so, put your foot down and the car does seem to move. Throttle response is impressive as it should be. Ride quality is not brilliant though, very firm, not anywhere near as plush as, for example, the VW E-Up that I drove recently. That is a disappointment, I would have expected it to be a little bit better. I suppose the theory is that should make it a little bit more fun in the twisty stuff, and we happen to have a couple of bends coming up, so I'll test the car's dynamics. I'm getting some feel through the wheel, this is quite a rough road, so if you're not getting anything here, you're never going to, but it's actually decent. The wheel itself is a two-spoke effect with a fairly thin rim and a two-tone colour scheme that I quite like. It's designed to evoke memories of the old 50s 500, as if many of us actually owned one of those. But I don't mind the odd retro touch here and there if the rest of the car is actually any decent. This La Prima trim comes with a 10 and a bit inch screen up here. I'm not sure if other models get a smaller one, I'm sure they still get something. And a JBL stereo that uh, Fiat say is unmatched. Considering I've listened to stereos that cost more than the whole car, I'm pretty sure this isn't going to blow me away, but last week I drove the Rolls-Royce Wraith inspired by music, which they also say is unmatched in the stereo department, so I'm going to put some tunes on very quickly, you sadly won't be able to listen to them, and I'll give you a five second summary of whether the system is actually any good or not. You know what? It's not going to blow you away, but it's actually pretty decent. For a car like this, it's okay. If this were a 15 grand car, I'd be very impressed with it. Anyone that's listened to the name for Bentley or the Rolls-Royce system is going to be very, very underwhelmed, but uh, that's not really a surprise, is it? This car being all new and Italian, I'm sure you're expecting it to be packed with quirks and features. Happily, you'd not be wrong. Fiat claim with a quick charger, you can put about 80% of range into this car in half an hour. Though their website also humorously states that you can get a day's worth of driving out of just a five minute charge. That, as far as they're concerned, is um, about 30 miles. This being a city car, I'm gonna quickly use the Co-op car park to test just how good it is for city car stuff. Transmission is buttons down here, moves into reverse nice and quickly. Really good tight turning circle, that's what you'd want. Got a reversing camera, which is nice. Decent, easy to place, as it should be. Very happy with that, good car. The indicators at the front of the car, like the steering wheel, are also designed to evoke memories of the old 500. Not sure how successful they are, but I don't hate them. The door handles are interesting too, entirely recessed. You put your hand in and feel for a button. They actually feel quite intuitive. I'm somewhat less impressed with the button to get out of the car, which you'll find here. It feels very cheap and plasticky, which I suppose matches with the rest of the door card. If this was covered in the same material as the seats, I'd be really blown away by the interior. That is a shame. Even more so is the fact that down here, you will find the emergency door release, same over there. 
and that's actually quite nice to use. The action is really pleasing. It's much more satisfying than pressing this nasty little button. That should have been how you get out of the car every single time. Feels like the release in the 430. It's lovely. If you're expecting Tesla levels of toys and things up here, you will be very disappointed. There's not really anything out of the ordinary. Same for the dash, very functional, very plain, and the buttons on the wheel are a touch disappointing because they feel somewhat cheap. This car also still has the same FCA little toggle switches behind the wheel that they've been putting in cars for about 15 years. Though I'm not gonna complain about those too much because they're darn handy and you don't see them, so I'm not that worried. I like the fact that down here you have both USB-A and C ports for your phone. That's nice. I hate the fact car makers are starting to put USB-C ports in the car because to me, USB-C should go on the phone end, not the device end. It's a stupid design, USB-C. I really, really don't like it. Alongside those ports, you will find plenty of space for your stuff, and indeed the whole cabin is pretty light and airy, partially thanks to this sunroof, which I really appreciate, though sadly it doesn't open. Apparently, the reason for that was that it would make the car just a little bit too expensive to receive the government grant, which is now discontinued anyway. I mentioned earlier there were some bends and those were set bends. The car is actually quite entertaining through them, tips in nicely. It's actually kind of agile, and the more you press on, the better the car gets. The suspension does start to work a little bit, though there's always a level of jitter and harshness to it that is a tad disappointing. I can't say that I've noticed it today, but one thing Vlad did say was that he felt like when we were doing the drive-bys, after just a few passes, it felt like the car wasn't delivering the full power anymore. If that is the case, that's kind of disappointing because it's not like we'd spent all day on track, and given the fact this is a liquid-cooled battery pack, I would have hoped the car could do just a little bit better. Whether that's a feature of the car or a fault, I couldn't say. Other things in here you might notice, on this top level car you've got this Fiat upholstery which I'm pretty sure is not leather because nowhere on the Fiat website is the word leather mentioned, so I take that to mean it's not leather. That being said, it does a decent impression of it, so I really don't mind it, it feels nice, and I love the Fiat monogram on the seats too, that's cool, that's stuff I like. Same goes for the outline of the city of Turin here on the wireless phone charger, Turin being the place where these cars are built. The other 500, which is still in production, is made at a factory in Poland. Fiat are also proud of the fact they've brought several features you may have seen in other larger, more expensive cars to the city car class. So, this has semi-autonomous driving, in other words, very smart cruise control when you're out and about on the motorway, and around town, it's the first small car to have level two automated driving, which in theory means it can kind of move through traffic more or less on its own. I'm not gonna test that tonight, because at nine o'clock, there actually isn't any traffic around here for it to be effective. There are also a selection of driving modes, as you might expect, but just the three of them here. You've got normal, which up until now I've been using, and range, which I've just switched into. The key difference with range is that it has much more aggressive regenerative braking. It also changes the throttle mapping. It's not any slower than normal, but you do have to press the pedal a little bit further to get the maximum performance. I actually kind of like it, and I can see why Vlad uses it. Through that little bin there, the car was actually kind of fun. Visibility is also very good, by the way. You can see everything, and the B-pillar is helpfully far back. A lot of modern cars get that wrong. The third and final mode is rather disappointing. It's called Sherpa, and when I saw on the Fiat website that this car had a new Sherpa mode, I couldn't help but wonder what they meant. In case you're unaware, Sherpas are the people that skillfully navigate tourists to the top of Mount Everest. So I thought, how does that link into a car? I began wondering, perhaps Fiat developed some new super clever sat-nav that finds the most efficient route or an interesting scenic one. No, that's not what Sherpa mode is at all. And if I were a Sherpa, I'd be very upset. What Sherpa mode actually is, is eco mode. So you get quite a lot of regenerative braking, and if you put your foot down, it does not really want to give you all that much power. Even worse, with Sherpa mode on, unless you put your foot all the way down to the kick down button, the car will also limit itself to 50 mile an hour. What's that got to do with Sherpas? Seriously, fear. come on. Other boring things to note, 
road noise is reasonable. It's there. This particular stretch I know is quite bad. Small cars never do that brilliantly. This is not Vlad's A8 long wheelbase, but I think it does okay. Boot space is also pretty decent. You do get a cable with the car. The lower powered variants with the smaller battery don't charge quite as quickly as this. They're limited, I think, to about 50 kilowatt hour. Both of them can charge by AC or DC. However, with AC, you're limited to 11 kilowatt hour charging. Vlad does charge this at home, but he doesn't have a wall box installed because one of the benefits of smaller, more economical cars with smaller batteries is that you can actually get a useful amount of charge out of a domestic three pin socket overnight. Try and plug a Tesla in and eight hours later, you're not gonna have a lot more range. One of these though, and you actually do quite well. Impressively, Vlad actually didn't even have to wait that long for this car because he ordered it in March and picked it up only a week ago. So that was the end of June. That's kind of surprising because at this point in time, just about anything and everything is on a year or two back order. Whether that means they're struggling to find buyers for these or they've merely done a deal with the devil to get the parts they need, I couldn't say. However, would I recommend it? This is the £30,000 question. As a well-known hater of the old car, do I feel like this has done enough to move the game on? You know what? I kind of think it has. There are disappointments. This cabin really should feel a little step up. They've gotten so close. I love the material on the dash. I like the seats. I like the look of the car. The color choices are a touch disappointing. They're all a little bit Scandinavian. I want bright yellows, bold blues, popping reds, all sorts of stuff. But beyond a rose gold and a kind of funky turquoisey green, there isn't really much exciting to choose from. This car was already specified, and maybe that's one reason Vlad could get it a little bit quicker. There was even a small dealer contribution, and anyone who's tried to buy a car recently will know getting those is not anywhere near as easy as it used to be. Gripes with the interior quality and the fidgety ride aside though, I actually do like it. It does seem to have a genuine bit of personality. I'm sure there'll be plenty who mourn the passing of the old Abarth, but I'd love to see what they can do with this. Hot one of these up, give it say 180 or 200 electric horses, and I think this would be a riot. It simply isn't the car for me because it just doesn't have enough range. But if the 199 miles of this is good enough for you and around town, you probably get more than that, I'd say it's a car I can actually recommend. And I'd probably have it over a Renault Zoe because it does feel just a little bit nicer in here. I think everything feels a touch more upmarket and the things Renault have done with Zoe to make it stand out, I don't really like. This, I do. The Honda E, similarly, if you live and drive exclusively in urban areas, is probably a good alternative. But if you do venture beyond the city walls, I think the extra range of this is well worth having. And it comes at essentially no premium over that. <laughs> Actually hung on that bend quite well too. Hmm, a lot of promise in this thing, I think. A lot of promise. Anyway, that I think is more than enough from me. I hope you've enjoyed today's video. I want to say a huge thanks to Vlad for bringing his car out today. And as ever, a thanks to you for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you all for the next one. Bye-bye.